Hey there, Refuge Church. I'm so excited to get into this next portion in church history with you. It's going to be good, so I'm going to pray and kick us off. God, I thank you that we have a rich tapestry um, of people who have walked in your paths, who have sought to follow the teachings of Jesus from all over the globe. I pray for humility, for openness, that you would um, teach us to learn something about ourselves and something about others through uh, this, this time that we're setting aside to learn this morning. I pray that your spirit would meet us in this place, um, that we might adopt a posture that looks more like you by its end. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we have, uh, as previously stated, we have been centering our time really in um, what is more mainstream in Christian curriculum. Um, if you grew up with that, either in Sunday school or in regular school or in college or whatever, um, it tends to be a really Eurocentric focus, a really Eurocentric story that we tell. Um, that is further bolstered by our cinematic depictions, right? We always see Charlton Heston or Ridley Scott's depictions um, of really whitewashed characters. Um, and so we start to imagine the, even the Greek folks, the Turkish folks in our stories as looking like, you know, Scottish, British men, right? Uh, whoever was cast. Um, and that's not helpful for us, not just um, in terms of representation, right? And people of color being able to see themselves represented in these stories of what God is doing in the world. It's also not helpful for us as faith communities because when we continually, ima continually imagine these great thinkers, these protagonists in the stories, these people that God used to enact incredible change in the world, and we always see them depicted to look just like us, um, we stop listening to, or it becomes harder anyway, to learn from people who don't look exactly like us. Um, we start imagining ourselves to be the protagonists um, and other people to be right the receivers of what we're bringing to the world. Um, that's hugely untrue, right? As we'll see in the story that we're going to talk about today or these stories. That's also unhelpful. Uh, it doesn't equip us well to be able to learn from the vast majority of the world who isn't from Europe, right? Who has um, contributed amazingly to the development of our faith and our faith traditions and the way we think about our faith, the way we do our faith, right? Um, there's also an invitation here, I think, before we even get started, as we learn, as we um, expand our vision of what Christianity is and what it looks like and who led it, um, uh, to be more specific when we say, well, the church today is blah, 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 or the problem with this is really this, or, well, in my experience, this is the thing, and this is our future orientation. Um, what we really mean um, when some of us say that, right, not all of our listeners here are um, people with lots of privilege and, and are white, but including myself, um, often what we mean is, well, churches in America. And even smaller than that, what we really mean is churches that are predominantly white in America have this problem or need to fix this or have this tendency or um, here is a, something that we might shift in our future um, navigation, right? Uh, it, it ignores and erases um, from the scene the enormous population um, of churches in America which are not predominantly white, right? We have indigenous community churches, we have Korean charismatic churches, we have a rich, amazing tradition of black churches in America who have contributed um, massively to the flourishing of all people um, in our country in ways that uh, we, we, um, speaking for myself here, right, are only just on the brink of starting to even pay attention attention to, to these issues. Um, I used to work in a building right next to a Nepalese church that was always wor worshiping off the chain, having a fabulous time. Um, and so let's be more specific when we talk about the church today um, 
we can talk more about my experience and my denomination um, with a group of people who probably looked mostly like me, right? Um, we want to be able to learn from, um, embrace, and acknowledge that there are a lot of communities of Christians who look totally different than us, who may have, of course, problems, but totally different than the ones that we um, might easily, um, self-centeredly, ethnocentrically apply to the whole church. So let's put the, uh, the brakes pedal on that a little bit. And I think learning today, um, all of us together will help us um, in our mission to not do that and to be able to learn from the rich tapestry of incredible global Christianity and our spiritual ancestors who were seeking to pursue God, follow out um, his way the best that they could, right? So let's learn a little bit. We're gonna zoom in first on Chinese and Mongolian Christianity. We talked about this already a little bit when we described the first break when we split and had the Church of the East. That was a conversation about the deity and humanity of Jesus, um, whether those two elements were separate or whether they were one combined thing. Um, and when we had that council and there's a split, the whole group um, of the East, right, East of Istanbul, so um, India, Central Asia, China, Mongolia, all spread off and became known as the Church of the East. Um, we're going to look at this figure, this individual, his name was Aluaban, um, and he was probably from Persia, might have been from somewhere else in Central Asia. He traveled eastward um, with the good news, <laughs> with the following of the way of Jesus, and he ended up finding favor with the local government in building a monastery. This monastery um, in central China became a hub, as we've seen has happened before, um, for monasticism and the development of theological thought and spiritual thought, but also for science and for translation um, and all sorts of things. This is a pattern that we've seen before in our previous episodes in the series, right? Um, he ends up um, writing as well. Um, he and his 21 friends at this monastery, that was the original number that started out, and they wrote these theological treatises that you can still read online. They're called the Jingzhao documents, um, and they're incredible to read over because they combine the wealth of Chinese thought and tradition um, with the teachings of Jesus. It's so, so interesting to read. So I'd encourage people to seek that out if they have any interest in it at all. Fascinating. Um, but Aluapan and his monastery attracts the eye of the emperor of the Tang Dynasty. This emperor is Emperor Taizong, and he was ruling over a real golden age in China. He was a very science oriented, very logic, um, rational, focused person, had a dislike for tradition um, and superstition. And he uh, really was very interested in Christianity, and he um, saw Jesus as a great sage. It was really an incarnated form of Taoist and Confucian teaching and wisdom. And so he adopted Christianity in this kind of synchronized form, syncretist form, um, which again we've seen in other episodes. Um, and this Christianity was called the luminous religion or the religion of light. Um, the terms for God in scripture included the highest emperor, the father of heaven, um, Jesus or Yehoshua, right in the Hebrew, was transliterated Yahuahua, uh, which means old gentleman of fiery magnificence. Um, I think that's great. They went with it. Uh, they also had 35 books of the Bible uh, Aluapan had brought with him and they translated into literary Chinese. It was Torah, the Gospels, the Psalms, the Book of Acts, and some of Paul. So a pretty nice, um, pretty nice chunk of scripture there. Um, 
so the way of Jesus had reached central um, China by 330, but it really started flourishing in the 600s. It took until 800 for the first major persecution to kick in. Um, and once again, we see familiar themes with that. Um, the emperor at that time, Emperor Wu Zong, was concerned about making China great again. We keep seeing that theme of anytime nationalist interests pop up, um, the quality of life and the quality of faith for people degrades. Um, and so he was worried about the proliferation of these different religions, um, Christianity, Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, uh, even Islam had come, um, reached that region by that time. Uh, and uh, this emperor was upset that the original Chinese religion um, was the Tao. And therefore, he said that um, they were poisoning China with these other faiths. Um, this emperor was also down on his luck economically. He had been fighting the Uyghurs. Yes, those, those Uyghurs. Um, and he claimed that women who were nuns, whether Buddhist or Christian, um, would be better spending their time, quote, with the silkworms, and that men should be using the land that monasteries had for plowing and for helping out the country economically. And so he disbanded 4,000 monasteries of all sorts of faith um, and sent over 300,000 clergy home. Uh, it would take until the Yuan dynasty, which was led by the Mongolian Christians um, in the 1200s for the teachings of Jesus to again flourish in China and Mongolia once again. So this is not the death of Christianity um, in China, it is just a 400 year interlude until the Mongolians come back, uh, which is simply wonderful. We're going to jump over to Ethiopia. So we do this little non-Europe tour, the Eastern Hemisphere, see what Christianity is up to in these Middle Ages. Um, of course, as soon as we say Ethiopia, we should think of one of the first converts to Christianity recorded in the book of Acts as the Ethiopian eunuch, right? So a third gendered fellow was um, converted and baptized. He had been reading scripture already, right? So we know that Hebrew scriptures had found their way down to Ethiopia. Um, Ge'ez, the language spoken or at least written in Ethiopia um, and Amharic both have uh, Semitic links. And so um, there are linguistically similar communities. He brings up these scriptures with him. And there's this lovely story of um, Stephen explaining Isaiah um, and uh, in relation to the work, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So the Ethian eunuch is the first, uh, first convert that we see um, in Acts. But tradition also tells us that Matthew and Bartholomew make their way down to Ethiopia, and that's how the gospel was first spread down there. Uh, again, according to tradition, Matthew was in the gospel of Matthew. However, Christianity really takes off in Ethiopia in the 300s. This fellow named Frumentius, um, you would get renamed Salama, um, was shipwrecked on the modern Eritrean coast. Uh, he became a slave, but then a slave tutor to the emperor uh, and it taught him about the teachings of Jesus. The emperor then made Ethiopia a safe haven, a refuge for escaping Jews and Christians who were running away from persecution from the Romans. Um, again, we see these same things happen. Monasteries are planted. Translation happens um, with the goodwill of the government. Um, change starts to happen, right? Legal changes start to happen in the country. The kingdom of Aksum, which is what this uh, region was ruled by, with King Azana, stretched across western sub-Saharan Africa um, and into Yemen as well, and the Horn of Africa, and then across the water there. Um, this kingdom, therefore, adopting Christianity, maintained close ties with the Coptic church to the north in northern Africa um, uh, during the persecution of the Amayyad Caliphate, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, they named their church the Tewahido, which means unified or being made one, um, a lovely thread that they're hanging on to, right? We've seen different people grab different things. Um, what is really important? That was what 
they believe to be really important. Beautiful thing. Um, maybe because of that, the church stayed away um, from unified power structures found in um, Catholicism. They rejected papal authority. Um, they rejected uh, indulgences, everything the reformers hated. Um, some scholars even suggest that um, some of our reformers in the 1500s might have been influenced or inspired by the Tawahido. Um, they paid a lot more attention to the Jewish roots of their Christianity, particularly, particularly in regard to commandments and ethics. So um, they, of course, prized the usual things um, that we see still continuing in this time of service, um, providing for the poor and marginalized is a key part of um, their Christianity, but they also kept kosher eating laws are found biblically and purification laws. They have a lot of fast. Um, they have a lot of foot washing. They have different genders sitting in different spots in their services. They have women's hair being covered. Um, they also have amazing singing and dancing and feasting being part of their very long services. Um, what can be helpful for us um, and maybe a moment for humility for some folks out there who really love connecting the Jewish roots, the Hebraic roots, sometimes called, um, to their Christianity. These folks have been doing that for thousands of years, right? And so if we feel like we're being rebellious or um, innovative, just know um, that you were not the first person to have that idea, right? Central Africa has been there for a lot, lot longer. Um, what was next on the agenda? What was next on the horizon? Well, we mentioned the Umayyad Caliphate was on the move. So, um, in the Middle East, Muhammad had died in 632, um, uh, CE or AD, and, um, that was in Saudi Arabia, modern day Saudi. Uh, and there was a succession struggle for who should be, um, the next leader of the Muslim community. And, um, 80% of the people, um, the Sunnis said that it should be, um, by consensus within the community, whoever they thought, um, should be elected to lead, should be the leader. The minority, um, the Shia Muslims believe that it should be family-based, that it should be dynastic. There are lots of other differences between the Sunni and the Shia, um, differences between, uh, the authority and infallibility of imams is something that the Shia community, um, they have differences in ways that they think about um, following the law, but this is the beginning of that conflict, if you were not familiar. Um, so the Sunnis won that conflict. They install uh, a couple of guys as their leaders um, through those decades, but only 30 years later, a fellow named Mu'awiyah was the governor of Syria and the son of a former caravan merchant, and he wrests power away from the elected caliph, the elected caliph, um, Muyawiyah, uh, anoints himself as the head of the Umayyad Caliphate. Um, and it tore through Central Asia, Northern Africa, and Southern Europe, right, Spain and Portugal, and conquered vast swaths of empire. Um, it's a large region, Central Asia to, to the Strait of Gibraltar, right, is a long, long space. Um, what was life like for religious minorities under the Umayyad Caliphate? Um, and that includes Christianity and Judaism and some Buddhism, right? Um, it depended. Um, sometimes in the Umayyad Caliphate and also the Abbasid Caliphate coming after, um, churches and monastic communities could be mostly left alone, right? This is some of the golden age of Islam. And so sometimes there was a lot of tolerance for worship and religious thought. And sometimes there was not. Um, churches and monastic communities in these different eras ended up being destroyed, um, which was a challenging for the social infrastructure, right? Because we've seen so much of how um, those places were hubs for education and arts and science and patronage. Um, and that was taken away and recentered elsewhere. Non-Muslims were classified by the government as dhimis. They were given dhimi status um, that granted them a protected status in society, but still a subordinate one. Um, they had to pay a special tax 
um, in order for um, protection and the freedom to practice their religion. Uh, they also faced certain social and economic restrictions. They had to wear distinctive clothing or distinctive colors to set them apart as not full members of the society and to place limitations on what kind of jobs they were able to hold. Um, so despite these restrictions, plenty of non-Muslim folk were still able to um, flourish, and contribute to cultural and scientific advancement, really further um, things along at that time, which is lovely, but we do see a slowing down of those uh, social projects and religious thought, um, the development of um, spiritual writing and theology in these areas in these times. Um, other caliphs within those two um, dynasties, dynasties would also enact severe periods of persecution where Christians were tortured or killed or imprisoned, um, big communities of folks driven from their homes to get out of the caliphate completely. Um, into non-empire space. So we've briefly dipped our toes, briefly. If you're interested in any of these things, please go look them up um, on reputable sources. Uh, there's so much more to any of these stories um, to discover. This is really just a, hey, did you know about this stuff? You can go find out more. Um, but what are our takeaways that we can learn from hearing just a few of these little stories? So first takeaway, takeaway number one, we're going to have three. Not only was Jesus brown, which some of us still have to remind ourselves, oh right, um, Jesus isn't the Obi-Wan Kenobi looking guy in our paintings, um, but early Christianity was not primarily white. Um, Christianity has always been a global religion with its center in West Asia, and it was not homegrown in Europe or America, right? Um, but uh, rather, we, um, people who look like me, are the receivers. Um, we're benefiting from the work of West Asian people, not the other way around. We are not the primary exporters of this faith tradition to the world, but rather the gospel has come to us whoop, because of the work of Asians. Uh, and that can be helpful, um, might turn some things upside down in our imagination about who we are and who is the savior of whom, right? Well, Jesus is the savior. We'll keep it simple there. Um, takeaway number two for us this morning is that the story of Christianity is so much bigger than Italian popes and St. Patrick or whatever we were only raised with. Um, not that all those stories are bad, right? There's some great stuff in there. Um, but the story of Christianity, the story of people who are trying to follow God, uh, who believe in the gospel, are also the story of Chinese emperors and the Huns and Ethiopians and Moroccans, people fleeing persecution, um, people sheltering other people, um, trying to be faithful to the ways of Jesus um, and find a path with the tools and opportunities that were presented to them. Um, we have so much more to learn about these folks um, and the people who have walked this path before us, right? If we think about it, um, if you have had a rigorous Christian education, that's awesome. You know one fourth of the story, right? It's pretty cool. Um, takeaway number three, our last one this morning, um, is I'd like to invite us to be strategic about the time that we've been placed in, to think carefully. Some of us feel like our um, era might be a particularly historic one. Some of us feel more that way than others. But in the patterns of these stories that we keep telling and, and hearing and learning, there's these individuals, right? We had the Turkish fellow who built the first hospital um, when he's given the opportunity by Emperor Justinian. We have in this episode, we have uh, individuals like Aluapan and Fermentius um, who took their one wild and precious life, shipwrecked or not, um, and armed with their integrity, armed with the things that they knew that they believed to be true, um, they were presented with these opportunities that they took to do something incredible with their lives um, and to bring flourishing to their world. So how um, are we preparing ourselves for the opportunities that might 
come our way, right? Nobody thinks they're going to talk to Emperor Justinian until they do. Nobody thinks that they're going to be a slave tutor to the King of Axum until they are. Um, so how are we preparing ourselves for these opportunities? We might not always have the privileged power, resources, and freedoms that we have now. We might have more in the future. We might have less. Um, all of these stories have big ups and downs, right? It was going really well, and then it wasn't. It was going really well, and it wasn't. Um, so where do we put our hope right through all of those swings? We can expect them. We don't have to be surprised by them, but we need to be grounded in something deeper and more solid and more beautiful than just like, yeah, things are going pretty groovy right now, man. I don't know. Um, how can we be strategic about our place in the story um, and our point in time that God has particularly placed us in? So I'm going to pray because I need the Spirit to help figure that out. Lord God, I thank you that you are intentional. You have made each of us. Um, we are a different vessel of pottery that you have made with specific gifts and particular proclivities and interests and desires and callings. And you put us in the spot that we're in for a reason. Um, I pray that we would have eyes to see that, um, that we might ask you and be in relationship with you and one another as we um, seek out our purpose, seek out uh, what it is that we're pursuing in this world. I pray that we wouldn't just go through the motions of having a pretty good job hanging out with our friends sometimes, um, but that we would be able to be strategic about who we are um, and what opportunities we have and how we can prepare ourselves for the opportunities that we might not have yet. Um, I pray also that you would um, give everyone who has listened to all of this grace, if there is anything offensive that I said or a way that I depicted something unhelpfully, I pray that um, people would still be able to hear the good um, that we did talk about today. I ask that you would give us um, that humility and that interest and curiosity and excitement to hear about um, people who look different than us, who have walked a different path than we have and value something different than we have. Um, valued in our lives. Um, thank you that this tapestry is so much bigger than the church experience we had growing up um, and that there's so much more life to be found in all of these incarnations of you walking around. So I pray um, that you would give us that excitement and you would give us that openness um, and that you would um, position us uh, in a place that we can have those opportunities to make change in our world. I pray that we would prepare ourselves and grow our integrity in the meantime so we might steward those opportunities well. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, um, online at refugepullman.com, there is a form to fill out if you'd like to join us online. There's also a little tab um, along the top that says give. Um, we accept one-time gifts, recurring gifts. It can be one dollar. <laughs> it can be a full tithe. Yeah, um, whatever suits you and your family. If Refuge Church has been something that's been life-giving to you, please consider tithing um, or giving. Thank you so much, uh, everyone who does uh, and has helped us out. Um, you enable us to continue to survive. We wouldn't have been here for the number of years that we have if it wasn't for your generosity, so thank you. Um, have a good week. Bye!